All right, so let's talk a little bit about CSS Grid and just what makes it so powerful. Now, I've got an example on the screen here that I do want to chat about, but I think to really fully appreciate it and to just fully appreciate the you know, construct of CSS Grid as a whole, we've got to take a little history lesson. We've got to go back to a land of float-based layouts when somehow things were more simple and more complex all at the same time. So this is Bootstrap, specifically Bootstrap version two. And if you're not familiar, Bootstrap is a uh, still pretty popular front end design framework. It's effectively a collection of baseline styles and components and JavaScript to solve common patterns that you might experience on a typical website. Um, just so you don't have to think through all that stuff and you can just focus on building out your idea. Um, and it is a really cool framework. And especially when it came out, um, it helped formulate a lot of how I approached and thought of about web design because um, I didn't just want to take it and kind of slap it on a project like some people might do, which is fine, um, and just call it a day. But I really wanted to take some time to kind of, you know, look under the hood, see how things really worked and get a sense of how um, these things were put together because Bootstrap was essentially put together by a team at Twitter, if I remember all my facts correctly. And it was uh, eventually open sourced and just given back to the web development community at large. Um, and it was a really awesome opportunity for, you know, just the everyday web developer to kind of see how, how the big boys and girls were doing it down at Twitter. And um, you could really take a look at, you know, how they were structuring and organizing their JavaScript, their components, their classes, their resets. Um, but one of the things that was most, you know, foundational and informative to me at the time was this grid system that they came up with. And this is primarily because we were entering an era um, of really beginning to leverage responsive design as a whole across the web. You know, up until then, you know, we were still in the land of, you know, kind of table-based layouts to some extent. Um, or you would still have maybe people that were just designing desktop based sites that were fixed width. And if you viewed them on a mobile device, you were kind of expected to just zoom in and look around. Um, but we were really starting to kind of explore, okay, well, what would it look like to, you know, design your content once, but have it kind of work everywhere. So I learned a lot about, you know, structuring content in that way from Bootstrap. I think a lot of uh, devs did and still do to some extent. And I think in some ways it's kind of formulated some of the approaches that you'll see um, to some things that we have in the grid spec now. And you'll see obviously how things have improved since then. But if you take a look at this grid here, we've obviously got these um, individual rows with columns inside them. And aesthetically, it's not that different from something you might see today. We've obviously got our rows and columns. We've got our gaps between our content here. And um, aesthetically, pretty straightforward. However, if we look at the markup, um, it's almost comical to look back now at just how much it took to get this working. Because you gotta remember, this is a time pre-CSS Grid, pre-Flexbox. Um, and basically what they did was they leveraged floats to set up these columns. So each row was basically a container that was needed because you had to put this clear fix hack. If you're not familiar with that, uh, go look that up. That's a fun bit of info from the, the vintage web. And this was used to ensure that the container didn't collapse around your floated content because floats can do that. It can kind of mess with the document flow a little bit. And we were effectively floating these columns to the left to give us this horizontal layout. Now, floats were not intended to create these kind of linear layouts across an axis like this. Um, you know, if we go back to the dawn of the web, floats were one of the first things that were invented effectively for um, web pages that were mostly text at the time. Think if you've got a large article or something and it's just long paragraphs of text and you've got these images kind of peppered throughout. Well, maybe you don't want that image to just be on its own line. Maybe you'd like to pull it kind of to the side, the right or the left and have your text wrap around it. Think like a 
magazine or a newspaper layout where you see these pull quotes or images um, drawn to the side. You know, that is effectively what floats were designed for. Just one-off elements, um, having block elements kind of wrap around them. And, you know, these guys at Twitter found um, a really unique way to leverage that and actually get a kind of predictable, consistent um, orientation across that X axis there. Um, but you can see that it's it's a lot of kind of magic numbers and management going on. So each of these are floated, of course, and there's a margin that's giving us our gap in between the columns there. But of course, if we've got that margin at the beginning of each column, if we wanna use these in a row, we've then gotta offset that margin with a negative margin so that we're not indenting everything unintentionally. And then on top of that, you've got all the math of it all. So um, if they did have a pixel-based grid, you effectively had to, um, for these spans, find the width it should be. So if I'm a 10 column grid or a 12 column grid, you know how wide should this column be to span across two air quote columns of this grid? So you're doing all that math and then you had to get the math of these gaps just perfect. And then if you ended up with like an odd number, and this especially happened with percentages, if you had like decimal places and the browser rounded up funny, sometimes you would get columns that would like be constantly glitching down to like a new line within a row. You know, it was just kind of a, a mess, but it did kind of work and it was all we had at the time. And I think seeing this can help give a lot of appreciation for, you know, where we've come with our current uh, technology, and in particular, grid-based layouts, which is what we're going to be talking about here. So I've turned on the grid inspector over in the dev tools there, and you can start to get a sense of just how much more uh, verbose and powerful um, and explicit things are with this new syntax. So one of the first things that I want to talk about that makes CSS grid so powerful um, and why it's such an improvement over where we've come from um, is the centralized templating you get from a parent as opposed to the old method of kind of, you've got a row and then on each of these columns you say, you know, I want this to be span two, span three, span four, because then on a mobile device, you've got to pick different spans for a different breakpoint or they all go to 100% width. You know, you just don't get this really finite control, this granular control that you might want from a more modern layout. So with Grid, we do all of our templating on the parent. And we're gonna talk more about the nuances of this as we go on through the course, but one of the central tenets of it is you've got your template columns and your template rows. And you define them directly on the parent here. So let's take these rows. You can see that I've got three rows of 80 pixels auto, and then 80 pixels. And then if I look over at my uh, browser here, you can see pretty clearly, there's our 80 pixels, our auto row, which basically just says expand to be the height of all the content inside. Um, and then we've got our 80 pixels down here. Now, the really cool thing about this is that I've defined this once. And if I wanna change it responsively on a different breakpoint, I can do that with this property very easy. A lot of these frameworks as they evolved through the years and we started needing more complex layouts across different screen sizes, you would start to see them turn into having things like, um, you know, large span two, medium span three, uh, small span six. It just became a mess of classes and juggling that you had to do to get it all working. Um, but with grid, we can do it all from one place and we know exactly what's happening and then inside that, our children can be placed anywhere on that grid. So that's the other really cool thing. Like this bit of content over here, this cell, you know, it might technically be the first thing in my grid, but I can actually place it last. So we have true source order independence is what we call it with CSS grid. Um, my content can be in any order I want in the markup. So for search engines or people who are browsing the web with assistive devices, you know, for the people that need certain things first, they can get it. But then visually, for people who are just browsing the web, um, 
like the vast majority of us might do, um, you can lay out things exactly as you want. So you're no longer beholden to, you know, the order your content is in the markup is how it has to be visually on the screen. The other really powerful thing is its expressive syntax. So there's no more magic numbers or math or anything we have to do behind the scenes. So, you know, when Bootstrap came out, all of these columns, you'll see each one has a different width associated with it. And I think at this point they did have pixel-based and percentage-based grids, but basically they had a big build script where you would go into a configuration file and you would say, you know, my site at its largest is a thousand pixels and I wanna use a 12 column grid and I want the gap to be 10 pixels. And so it would figure out like if you needed a, a one span column, how wide it should be, taking all those factors into account, a two span column, three span, so on and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of tooling involved, a lot of, um, again, kind of magic numbers because I've got to then take these gap values and use them on other elements to offset things in certain ways. Um, again, it just becomes kind of a stack of one hack on another, on another, and it worked for a time. Um, but the amazing thing with CSS Grid is we get this really um, clear, expressive syntax. So let's take these columns for a second here. You can see that we've got four VW, which is a viewport width unit, which basically just means 4% of the browser's entire viewport. And then we've got this repeat statement in the middle here. So you'll see that we've got tons of vertical lines going across here, but we've really only got three columns here written out. This 4VW, repeat, and then 4VW. Well, this repeat statement, which we're gonna learn more about in the course as we go on, is saying, repeat whatever is in this second parameter six times. And so we can see that statement is one rem, one FR, which is a fractional unit. We'll talk about that more. And then one rem. And if I just go look at my template, we can see that right here is our four VW. But then right here is our one rem, repeating with our one FR, one rem, or I'm sorry, and then repeating again right here. So we get that pattern six times. And ultimately what that gives us is all of these lines or these opportunities to lay out and orient our content in unique ways. So, you know, this is Geometry Grid. It's a design cloud asset I've built out um, quite a while ago now. Um, definitely go download it. We're actually gonna be talking about this as an example later on in the course. But I knew when I built this that I wanted to do some really cool stuff with like layering elements on top of one another. Um, and you can see this background element here, which is at 50% and spreading to the edge of the screen. Sure, I could easily do that with something like a background image where maybe it's transparent or this gray color and then this. But what about when I go responsive and I get to this breakpoint? If I had done that with a background image, that content is still gonna be you know, gray over here and then the image over here. But since that was just an image element, that I had placed on my grid across these lines, you can see that now on this entirely different viewport, I have an opportunity to shift everything around and move that image down here and still use it in a creative way, but in a way that fits this context more and is not as you know rigidly adherent as a very static background image. And we can take it one step further. If I go a little bit smaller, You'll see that now we've gone to essentially a one column layout. And now that image is really stretching more on the vertical axis, but still offset a little bit from the side. So we have a lot of opportunity when we're working with these grids, since we can place everything anywhere um, to be more creative with our layouts. And then of course, like I just said, the expressive syntax, the, the no magic numbers type of thing, um, basically, simplifies things for us. We can just kind of offload, you know, that mental chore to the browser. And then the final thing I really want to touch on is that um, CSS Grid gives you control in two dimensions, which we're going to talk about in more detail in this following video, where we compare and contrast Flexbox with Grid um, and kind of when and why you might want to use one over the other. Um, but having control over the second axis is a huge thing that we've never really had 
um, in web development. And basically what it means is, just like with this, I can not only define my template rows, let's say, but I can use certain units like this FR unit, which we'll go into more detail later on, to create special relationships between things. So I can say, you know, this row should be double the height of this row, um, which we've never been able to do before in web development. And some of those examples, they might seem kind of far off in your head right now, but as we continue to move through this course, I think you'll start to see that grid will begin to unlock all sorts of, you know, possibilities and permutations of ideas that maybe you'd never even considered before because you simply didn't have the tools to explore it. Um, and that's really the point of this whole course is, um, you know, we're not saying that CSS grid is the, you know, the end all be all of layouts. Um, you know, conversely, I actually think it's the second side of a two sided coin with something like Flexbox. I think they very much operate together as a pair. Um, and they help you solve the whole puzzle together because they each have strengths in areas where the other one doesn't. Um, but really the point of the course here is to kind of um, just give you more tools in your tool belt, you know, because when all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, and I think by the end of this course, you'll really start to um, see layouts with a little bit more nuance and how to approach them um, in simpler and more creative ways ultimately. So um, that is effectively, for me, what makes CSS Grid so powerful. It's that centralized templating, which helps make responsive styling so much easier. Uh, very expressive syntax, no magic numbers, no math, um, lots of helpful units to use that offload that to the browser. True source order independence. We can place our children anywhere on the grid, no matter where they are physically on our markup. And then that uh, second dimension of being able to lay things out. Those two dimensional layouts are huge. And we're gonna talk about that more in the next video here.